This morning we're going to continue with our Advent series, our brief look at Jesus' words, or some of them at least, where he said, I have come. Uh, The word Advent means to come, to arrive, to appear. And so we're tracing through some of the reasons Jesus himself said, I have come for this, I have come to do this. And today we're going to look at one of the most famous and popular sections, uh, John 10.10. Many of you have said to me already, this is one of your favorite verses, which makes me nervous. So I'm probably not going to get it right. It's not going to live up to everything that, uh, that you want it to be. Uh, but hopefully we'll at least find something edifying here. Let me read, I'm going to read the whole section to you, uh, John 10, 1 through 18, and then we'll look primarily at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also And they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Great passage, there's a lot there. I'm tempted to launch right into a full exposition, but uh, I won't. We're going to talk about life abundantly. I have come that they might have life and have more of it. It's a powerful passage. It's a very encouraging passage at face value. It's one that we want to get excited about, but I've always wondered what exactly does he mean by abundant life? I mean, I have a very vivid imagination. I could take that all kinds of places. This this is how I would define abundant love. This is uh, abundant life. This is how I would define this moreness of life. And, and it may not be exactly what Jesus had in mind. So I finally figured out this week, I think I know why it was such a struggle for me to understand exactly what he meant by abundant life. It's because I was looking at it from my perspective. But really, in context, I should be looking at it from a sheep's perspective. Right? Because he's a shepherd. And he's saying, these sheep come after me and I'm going to give abundant life to the sheep. So that made me ask the question, all right? If I were a sheep, what would be abundant life to me? And I think there are three things. Number one, got to have good food. Sheep, sheep want to eat. Why are you laughing? Sheep want to eat. I'm preaching. Think about Psalm 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd and he leads me into green pastures beside still waters. Green pastures where there's a lot of, a lot of vegetation, a lot of good thick grass and forbs and, and all kinds of stuff that they can eat. They're, it, they're just surrounded by it. There's so much good stuff. We want to eat. Think about how many times the Bible speaks about hunger and eating and tasting. Think about the Beatitudes where Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That describes a Christian, doesn't it? We have a yearning, an aching, an, an appetite to be righteous. We want to please our Father in heaven. We want to please the Lord Jesus, not out of some sense of just duty, but because we know his love, because we know how much he has demonstrated his love on the cross for us, and we want to respond by pleasing him, and we know that what pleases him is that we pursue righteousness. And as Christians, that hunger grows and it aches. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger for this, for you will be satisfied. He will feed us. And that, that hunger will begin to to grow satisfied over time. Think about the, uh, the classic statement that we all know from Psalm 34, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste him. And in the context of the psalm and indeed the context of the whole scripture, God is lavishing upon us gift after gift, grace after grace, good thing after good thing that we are supposed to taste and eat of and recognize this is not by accident that I have these things. I didn't stumble onto these good things. The God of heaven has blessed me. He's lavished me with this grace. And we are supposed to taste that and eat it. And as we consume it, we give praise and glory to God knowing that he has provided these things. Taste him. Consume God himself. And see that he is good. And our hunger will be, will be satisfied. Later on in John, Jesus is going to say that the one who comes to me and drinks the water that I will give him, out of him will flow rivers like living water. That's a strange metaphor. A river of living water inside you. Well, John tells us what that meant. The original hearers didn't get it all right away, but he explains what it means. He said, I, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And we know that at Pentecost, the Spirit of God came down to indwell his people. And from that point forward, all of his people have the Holy Spirit. Think about what the Holy Spirit does for you and me. What it means that we have him residing in our being. Think about the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Did I get them all? Okay, good. How abundant is your life and mine when those things are true of us? I mean, can you imagine a fuller life than a life that is filled with love, divinely given, divinely empowered love for other people, love for the Lord Jesus. We all want joy. It's, it, it, it may describe the, the greatest ache of all of our hearts, that profound joy, and that's a, an effect, a fruit of the Spirit. Peace. Peace with God, peace with others, that kind of inner calmness. Think of Jesus when he said, all who come to me, I will give them rest for their souls. Is there anything you want more than rest in the deepest part of your being? That Just calm rest. Patience, kindness gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? How much of your life would be so much fuller, richer, abundant, better if you just had more self-control? Like, you know, this thing right here? 
that gets us in so much trouble, if we could just control our tongue, think about how much more your life would seem full and rich. That spirit indwells all of God's people. If you are here today and you are a Christian, you have that living water within you. You have the Spirit of God within you, and that's the fruit that he produces. We have abundant life, full life. Can you think of anything better than manifesting all of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? There's nothing more satisfying. Earlier in John, prior to John 10, Jesus says about himself, I am the bread of life. I am. I'm the manna come down out of heaven. I'm your sustenance, and all who come to me, all who believe in me, will eat and never be hungry again, never thirst again, and indeed will have eternal life. This abundant life is not simply something for here and now. We get foretastes, we get little pictures, we we begin to experience it, but ultimately the supreme life that he's talking about, this abundant life, is the next age when we will be with him forever and feast with him forever. Jesus said, I came to give you sheep life to the full, abundant life, and includes feasting on Christ himself. Second thing that sheep need and want, protection, safety, security, Think again of of the 23rd Psalm of of the shepherd there. The Lord is my shepherd, and and with his staff and his rod, he brings comfort to me. The rod, it's the stick the shepherd uses to run off all the enemies, to run off the wolves and other predators. Jesus, the good shepherd, takes care of his sheep. He has a rod, and he runs off the would-be predators. You know the verses. Satan, we are told, roams around like a hungry, roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's seeking you. He's seeking me. And he wants to chew us up and spit us out. He wants to distract us from the things of God. He wants to destroy our faith. He wants to divide us one from another. He wants to do everything he can to keep us from seeking hard after Christ. That's what Satan's after. He wants, to, he wants to ruin us, and we are told if you just resist him, he'll flee like a scaredy cat. My translation. He'll run away because greater is he who is in you and me than he who is in the world. Jesus will run him off. We are told that, that he schemes, that Satan schemes and he plots and he, he's trying to find a way. He plans, actually, ways to destroy us. But Jesus says to the Apostle Paul, just put on my armor. Just put it on. Put on the helmet and the breastplate and the, and the shoes and take off the shield. Just stand firm in my strength and he can do nothing to you. He can try. He's going to keep firing his darts, but they're just going to hit and bounce off, hit and bounce off, hit and bounce off because we have a shepherd with a club who will run him off and beat him away in our behalf. Everything Satan wants to do to you, and he's after you, you can withstand. You're stronger than the enemy in Christ, in the good shepherd. The wolf can't hurt you. He can't destroy you. Because you have the great champion of heaven as your protector. That's abundant life. That's life to the full, being safe and protected from all of your enemies. He uses the staff. The shepherd has a staff. The staff, you know, has that crook on the top, that, that, that curve. That's to yank the sheep out of a bush that he gets trapped in. Sheep aren't very smart. You know, when the, when the scripture calls us sheep, it's not a compliment. And we get stuck in places we shouldn't be. And he's got that staff to grab a hold, put around our neck, and yank us out. Or if we get too close to the edge of a, a cliff or something where we will hurt ourselves, he can yank us back. The Bible has another word for this. It's called discipline. He protects us from ourself. He protects us from the dangers that we want to pursue in and of ourself. He grabs, that, grabs us with his, with his staff. 
the writer of the book of Hebrews talks quite a bit about this discipline. And it's not an exciting passage. It's probably not our favorite passage. may not even be in a wanna verse. I don't know. But he says, you know, just like any father who loves his child, God disciplines us. If you're a father and you don't discipline your child, the scripture says you hate your child because you're teaching them to do whatever they want to. And that makes you an enemy of God if you pursue whatever you want. And God, as a loving father, he disciplines his children. And the writer of Hebrews says there, it hurts. If it's not painful, it's not discipline. Got to make them cry. God makes us cry sometimes, doesn't he? He brings hard things into our lives, never out of a motivation to inflict harm for the sake of hurting us, but always because he loves us. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to train us. And at the end, the Hebrew writer says, the fruit that is born out of his discipline is righteousness. We are more Christ-like. We're more pleasing to our Father because he has taken the time to lovingly discipline and correct us. And that's for our good. We don't like it particularly, but we need it. A few years ago on Mother's Day, uh, I put together a little video for Krista, and I had all the the kids privately in their different uh, rooms. I said, okay, do something, you know, special for mom, and uh, and then say whatever you want to say to thank her for being your mom. And it was great. Uh, I I almost brought it to show you, but I decided that would be self-serving. But it's really cute. Uh, Never forget, Gabe was... Two, thank you. And uh, he just, he's trying to get it. Say, uh, what do you want me to, yeah, I'm trying to get him to say the right thing, and he didn't know what to say. And I finally just said, say Happy Mother's Day. And he said, Happy Mommy Day. It was just so precious, so cute. Someday I, I will show it to you and embarrass him. <laughs> but my favorite was Abby. Because Abby, she just had the sweetest expression, cutest look on her face. And, and she, she's sitting on the edge of her bed. And I don't know if you've spent much time talking to Abby, but her face tells every story. She has such expression. She's got, you know, five or six dimples, and they're all cute, and she smiles, and her eyes go in and out, up and down, and just just her face says so much. She she can't ever get away with anything, (laughs) which is wonderful as a father to know that, that she could never lie to me because her face would say, I'm lying to you. It's wonderful. It's great. And she's sitting on the edge of her bed, and she's just so cute, and she's sitting there kind of like this, you know, a little four-year-old, just precocious, and like, Mommy, thank you for feeding us, and and thank you for all your presents, and and thank you for teaching us. You teach us so many things. Thank you for teaching us songs, and thank you for teaching us about Jesus, and and thank you for cleaning the house, and thank you for making my bed, and on and on and on she goes, and and just on her own, spontaneously said, I'm not going to say thank you for your discipline. No, 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 because I don't want to thank you for that. That doesn't feel good. (laughs) It It was so precious, and you know what? Someday she's going to get to the place where she will come back and thank Krista for disciplining her. She may not be there yet, but someday she will. You know when a parent is lovingly disciplining you, it's for your good. When she gets older and exercises great self-control, not that she doesn't have it now, but when she gets older and has great self-control, she's going to come back to her mom and say, thank you for teaching me not to just do everything I want. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus does. That's what our shepherd does. He takes his staff and he says, uh, it's going to hurt a little, but I need to yank you back off the edge. I need to pull you out of the thickets. Now, bringing the protection aspect and the, the meal, the food aspect together, in, in Psalm 23, if you remember, uh, partway through, he says, you, shepherd, you, Lord, prepare a place for me, a meal for me in the presence of my enemies. You ever thought about that? Here you are, from, the, from, from Psalm 23 perspective, you're a sheep, and there are wolves all around you with their teeth exposed, and they want to chew you up, and the Lord sets up this huge banquet, a feast for you, right in the middle of the wolf pack, and the Lord says, eat. And the picture there is of this little helpless lamb enjoying all the food he can possibly do with the wolves just sitting there. And they can do nothing because the shepherd is there and they're scared to death of the shepherd. That's how secure we are in Christ. 
you can just eat right there in front of all your enemies. Go for it. Enjoy the meal because they can't touch you. They can't hurt you because the Lord is your shepherd. That's abundant life. That's a full life, not having to be afraid, enjoying the good gifts, enjoying the food that the Lord provides for you, enjoying the fruit of the Spirit, enjoying feasting upon Christ himself in the midst of all the enemies and not being terrified because there's nothing they can do. What's the worst they can do? What's the worst any person can do to you? Send you straight to Jesus. All right? I mean, I I don't mean that flippantly. I don't want to die a torturous death. But at the end of the day, even if I do, all it does is send me straight to the presence of God. What can they do to me? Nothing. Third thing that I think a sheep needs and wants is to be near the shepherd, to be with the shepherd. Did you, did you, did you see all that? There's a lot, of, a lot of care and intimacy here in this passage. He says, Jesus says to them, uh, when, he, when he talks about uh, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd. That's, that's Jesus, right? To him, the doorkeeper opens. The doorkeeper doesn't let the imposters in through the door. The doorkeeper knows who the shepherd is too. And when the thieves come and say, no, you're not welcome here because you're not a shepherd. And they have to climb over the fence somehow. They have to sneak in. But when the real shepherd comes, when the true shepherd comes, the doorkeeper says, come on in to your sheep. And Jesus says, I am that that uh, shepherd. And the doorkeeper knows me. Verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. In my understanding, shepherds in antiquity did not name their sheep. You name your pets, right? You got a dog and you have a name, or maybe you have three dogs and you have names for all of them. And hamsters, you name your hamsters. And guinea pigs, you name your guinea pigs. And if you have rats, you name your rats. And if you have fish, you name your fish. And that's just kind of how we are as people. But if you had 300 of them, probably wouldn't name them all. And even if you did, you and I both know, you wouldn't actually know that this one was Fido. Right? I mean, you might have your favorites, but you wouldn't know all their names probably. If you had a thousand of them, you surely wouldn't take the time to name them all, and you would know who they all are probably. But Jesus, the great shepherd, calls his sheep by name. Do you realize that what that means for you and me? He knows your name. And when he thinks of you, he thinks of you by name. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, who has seven billion people to keep track of, looks at you and he says, hey, Randy, I'm talking to you. Ron, come, let's go out into the pasture for a while. He knows you. Jesus Christ knows your name. Now, the point is not that he just knows it. Of course, he knows he knows everything. The point is he uses it. He thinks in terms of your name. He calls you. That's an intimacy. That's a love. To to call somebody by their name indicates there's some relationship here. I love my wife. And I love, one of the cute things I love about her is whenever a salesperson calls, she instantly listens for their name, and she starts talking to them by name. And I, I funny because I'll be listening on the other, uh, you know, I'm just hearing her side of it, but she's, she's, hello, John. Hi, John. Hey, John, I was wondering if you could help me with it. And John, and she's always using his name, and I think, oh, you're on a first name basis with John already, right? But that's just how she, like, everybody's her friend. See, with me, I don't even hear their name. I'm not concerned. I just want them to fix my problem. That's why we're talking right now, right? Customer service rep or whatever. But it is, it, it shows instantly a care for the person on the other end of the phone, to call them by name. When new people come, I try to learn your names and I'm not all that good at it. She's really good at it. But you want to know somebody's name because it expresses intimacy and love and concern. Jesus Christ knows your name. And it says he leads them out. You've been in the pen for a while. Come on out. Let's go out to to find some greener pasture. Jeff, let's go. 
Bill, let's go. Abby, let's go. We're going to go out here and we're going to find some cool, clean water and a nice place to lay down for a while and you don't have to worry about any wolves or predators. Let's just go out and, and enjoy our time and then we'll come back in and I'll put you back in the pen and you can rest in safety and security there. He knows us by name. His sheep don't know the voice of strangers, but they know him. Even when it gets really, really, really bad. Again, thinking of the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the shepherd is with me. So dark. I, I know I've, I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again. The Psalm 23 is not really a funeral psalm. You hear it at funerals all the time. We use it at funerals all the time, but it's not about someone dying. It's really about someone who almost wishes he were dead. The valley of the shadow of death, it's really the valley of the shadow of great darkness. You actually survive the, sh the valley in that psalm. But it's so dark, you cannot see one foot in front of you. You can't see your hand in front of your face is how dark it is. And you hear the howling of the wolves and you're terrified and you're scared and you think, I'm going to trip and fall to my doom or I'm going to be eaten alive by the wolves. And yet the psalmist says, I'm not afraid. Because even there when I can't see a thing, the shepherd is nearby. He's close. I remember seeing an illustration of this some years ago. And, uh, and it kind of stuck with me, and I actually thought there, there might be a way even to improve it from what I saw. But there was a, a, a scenario where uh, someone had set up this uh, on a stage, a big thing like this, with uh, glass all over it. And, and a boy was told to take off his shoes, so he had just bare feet, and there's glass all the way around. And his father was on the other side. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, son, where the safe places are to walk. And, and there were, uh, you couldn't really see it from that perspective, from that side, but from this side you could see where those flat places that were not shattered glass were. And he, ta he told his son, you know, take a, a little step to the left and put your, no, not there, there. Now, there, step there, it'll be safe. And then he had him go back over here to a safe place and back and forth, slowly, slowly. And he was listening to the voice of his father pull him across and he got all the way across unscathed. Never stepped once on a piece of glass. And the illustration was there that, you know, if we listen to the voice of God, he will show us where those safe places are, even when it is treacherous all around us. And I thought, but I would want to illustrate it this way. Put a blindfold on the boy to illustrate the valley of the shadow of darkness. But in that case, it's not simply, son, just step out to the left a little. No, no. The shepherd goes and takes him by the hand and puts his foot on the, on the safe place and his foot on the safe place and his foot on the safe place. And so he doesn't just call out, but he actually brings him safely to the other side. That's the imagery I see here in Psalm 23, that the shepherd, I can go through the valley of the shepherd of death, uh, the shadow of death, because I'm close to the shepherd. I hear him. He's actually the one leading me step by step through life. He's close. He cares. We're safe. There's intimacy there. And we want to be near him. It's one of the great longings of the heart of a Christian to be close to our Savior. Can you imagine a more abundant life than being with him? We want to be with people we love, right? A couple days ago, I was uh, uh, walking through the, through the house and Krista came by and I just grabbed her and, and hugged her. And we stood there for a little bit, and she kind of, you know, thought, okay, we're done. And I held her heart high, tighter, and then she held me tighter, and she kind of heard me muttering something. What are you saying? I said, I'm counting. Why are you counting? Well, see, I just read this article <laughs> that said good couples have the happiest couples twice a day hold each other for 20 seconds. And, of course, then they ruined it by some medical explanation, you know, endorphins. It takes 20 seconds for the endorphins, yada, 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 yada. It just feels good. 
And you know what she did? She hugged me further, tighter. And then spontaneously, she just said, this is you know, 30 seconds, now the dwarfins are just screaming through our bodies. And just spontaneously, she said, I feel safe. I wasn't trying to convince her of safety. I was just holding her because the magazine told me to. I was just... <laughs> I was just hugging her, and she felt safe. Well, that's the imagery, isn't it? Our shepherd comes and says, we're going to go out the door, and we're going to go out here into what seems to be the wild, but I got you. And he scoops us up now and then, and he just holds us for more than 20 seconds. And the endorphins are raging through our body, and we just keep Exhaling and relieving and releasing and we just feel safe because we're with Jesus, because he's got us, because we're near to him. Can you imagine a more full, abundant life than having your deepest hunger and thirst satisfied? than being completely protected and secure by the creator of the universe, by being in his presence and led by him, and he knows you by name, and he just makes you feel safe. What else could we want? You start stacking up the worldly pleasures, they don't relate, they don't compare to that. There are a lot of people that have a lot of pleasures, a lot that money can buy, a lot of power, a lot of uh, security in the human sense, and they are miserable. And the last thing they would tell you is, my life is full. In fact, what we hear over and over and over again from the world is, my life is empty. There's got to be something. If I just keep searching far enough and and long enough, and if I get more money and more relationships and more pleasure and more this, more that, more that, I'm going to find it so I can find something that fills this emptiness, and they won't. Because they can't, there's only one way to experience abundant life, and that's to know the Good Shepherd. Now, there's a lot of people that want to convince you they can give you abundant life. That's what Jesus means when he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. There are a whole lot of people in our culture that would call to you and say, look, if you'll just come follow me, if you'll just come hang out with me, if you'll let me shepherd you, I can give you great stuff, great experience, great fulfillment. And you know what they want? They want your money. They want something they can take from you. Some of these people call themselves pastors, and they get on television, and they put on a big show and say, look, God wants to bless your socks off. If you'll just send me $3,000, he will bless you abundantly. They're thieves. Some of these are politicians. Look, if you just let the government rule your life, you'll be happy as you can be. Some of them are temptresses and seductresses and saying, look, if you'll just come to me, I'll make you really, really happy. They'll want something, really. They're not trying to give us abundant life. They're trying to take from us so they can pursue their own course. Jesus said, everybody else, they're all imposters. They're all thieves and robbers, and they're trying to hurt you at the end of the day, but I'm the good shepherd. And you know how good I am? You know how concerned I am for your well-being? I'm going to let the wolves devour me. I'm going to let the enemy have his way with me so that you can be safe. Actually, that's not exactly what happened, is it? It wasn't the enemy, ultimately, that was the one who took his life. He said, I'm going to meet your greatest need by laying down my life to suffer the wrath of God that you deserve. I who am perfect, I'm the good shepherd, sinless, perfectly obedient. I'm going to let the Father treat me as though I were you so he can treat you as though you were me. That's how much he loves us. He gave us his life on the cross for our sin. He's the good shepherd. Everybody else, just an imposter, just a a, a robber. 
Now you know how the end of Psalm 23 ends. You know how it concludes. David says there, This I know because the Lord is my shepherd. Surely, undoubtedly, two things are going to follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy. Or goodness and loving kindness. Remember he started off saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't have any needs that go unmet. I shall not want. And at the end, he just says, I know this. If the Lord is my shepherd, if he's the one guiding me, protecting me, and feeding me, then for the rest of my life, this I know, what's going to be mine are goodness and love from the shepherd. Now, you've all learned this. You all memorized this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But actually, the Hebrew word for follow there is not really follow in the way we think of it. It's not like I'm going to go and it's just going to happen to drag along. It's the word pursue. Do you see how that changes it? Because the Lord is my shepherd, goodness and love are going to pursue me. They're going to chase me down. And they're going to overtake me. Look at your life. Yes, there are periods of trial. Yes, there are periods of hard things. But as we've already said, even those are for our good. But look at all the good things in your life. Look at all the blessings, all the favors, all the kindnesses, all the joys. That is goodness and loving kindness from your heavenly Father chasing after you and overtaking you. Because the good shepherd loves you. Then at the end of the book, the end of the book, the end of all things, we see all these pictures coming together. Someday, beloved, someday, we are going to eat like we've never eaten before. Jesus himself is preparing a banquet feast. He's going to feed his sheep. And Dave Graff makes a pretty good ice cream. I, got, I heard one of the laymen. You, you aren't spreading it around enough, Dave. But even David Graff can't make ice cream like Jesus makes ice cream. I cannot wait to dive into that peanut butter ice cream that the Lord Jesus made. He's going to make. I told you, we've been over this. The bowl's gonna, my first bowl is going to be this big. I'm going to be like trying to lift it over here so you can't have any and eat it myself. And that's for... Appetizer. <laughs> He's going to lavish a banquet on us, and we are going to eat and be so satisfied we will never again wish for something else. And yet, it'll probably give us more food that'll even be better than that. And we're going to eat this banquet not in the presence of our enemies because they're all gone at that point. When we get to that table, there will be no sorrow. There will be no pain. There will be no strained relationships. There will be no disappointments. There will be no job layoffs. There will be no divorces. There will be no anxiety, no frustration, no irritation, no doubting. No questioning, no wondering. There will be no tears, no cancers, no diabetes, no back problems. There won't even be death. Because that enemy and all the others will have been swallowed up in the lake of fire at that point. So we're going to eat this lavish feast with no enemies around to be concerned about in the least. And we will be joined with our husband in intimacy forever. That's the highlight, that's the climax of everything, is that we will now dwell with the good shepherd for all eternity. Not just the spirit in our hearts, as great as that is, but somehow it's going to be closer. 
It's going to be more intimate. It's going to be glorious simply because Jesus is there. No longer veiled. No longer waiting for him to return. He will have returned and forever and ever and ever and ever, world without end, we will be with him. And there will never be a day, ever, when we will think, this is really good, but life would be really abundant if. We'll never say that. We can say it today. I told you before, I've got a great imagination. I can always think of something a little bit better. And I've got a great life, and the Lord is blessing me, and I am very joyful, very happy, very content. But, but I can imagine things being a little bit better. Some days a lot bit better. But when we get there with him, eating at that table with no enemies, intimately with Christ, we will never again think, pretty good, but... Life would be full if. We'll never say that again. This is what Jesus came to do. I have come. Not like the thieves who want to rob and steal from you. I have come to give you life. And life abundant. Friends, if we don't enjoy abundant life now, I think there's really only one explanation we're not seeking it from the good shepherd. We're seeking after a thief and a robber, an imposter, a false messiah. If we are seeking abundant life from Christ, he has said, this is why I've come. There is no reason for us not to experience satisfaction of our hungers, a life filled with the Spirit, a protection and a provision from Jesus Christ himself as all precursors and foretastes to eternity. No reason at all. It's yours if you'll just seek him. Music team, come lead us in the great Christmas hymn, Joy to the World. Let heaven and nature sing. Let's stand together and sing about our Savior who came to bring us abundant life.